Asalaamu As Alaikum everyone, I'm Imran and I'd like to welcome you all on behalf of the Islamic Society of Britain and its youth wing ISB campus to this online masterclass on understanding childhood trauma uh, presented by Dr. Yasser Abbasi. Uh, it's a very important topic, but before we uh, go, go over to that, I just have a few announcements and things to share. My Lord, expand for me my chest and ease for me my task and untie the knot from my tongue that they may understand my speech. So this is this event is being hosted by Islamic Society of Britain and its youth wing ISV campus. The vision of ISV campus is to create a space where British Muslim youth can explore faith in a contem contemporary, friendly and spiritual way. As, but what do they do? So we uh, run online circles. So for example, um, this is a Quran recitation and reflection circle. We had one a week ago on the 21st of May and there's an upcoming one on the 18th of June. And I'd really recommend going to those if you want to learn more about the Quran. And um, yeah, another thing we do, um, so this is the current event. So ISB campus do lots of these online masterclasses that are open uh, to the general public. Uh, like this one and um, yeah uh, we also have regular sixth form of pressure circles so these are for people um, from 16 to 20 years old uh, the last one was on dating boyfriends and girlfriends the one before that was on stewards of the earth they're really amazing circles everyone there's really friendly and, and we have amazing discussions about uh, contemporary topics uh, we also have circles for the younger age groups, so 14 to 16 year olds and 11 to 13 year olds uh, under the name of Young Muslims e-circles, similar to the ones that we have um, for uh, campus, but with topics more relevant to these younger year groups. Uh, we also have an in-person masterclass coming up on, the su on Sunday, the 25th of June, and that's in Birmingham, and it's about the path to success and how we can build a CERN in our lives. Uh, it's similar to the online masterclass in the sense that you learn a lot and it's coming from a professional, but they're really amazing because they're the entire day and it's in person. So that's just amazing. Here is a QR code to join the uh, chat for all the notices. So if you want to keep up to date and if you want more information about all the stuff I've been talking about, please join this chat. I'll leave out for a few seconds. And you can all also email info at isb.org.uk if you'd like to donate to the course by becoming a member. And here are the social medias and all other contact details to buy us from ISB. And with that, over to Dr. Yasser Abbasi, um, consultant addictions psychiatrist, executive medical director at Westminster Drug Project. He's the chair of Pain Charity UK, chair of International Psychiatry and, Ad and Addiction Masterclass, uh, Dubai, ex ex executive member of British Pakistani Psychiatrists Association. We're really lucky to have him here. Uh, and over to you. Uh, you're muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, it's all good. Okay, it would have been great if I knew how to handle technology. Uh, so thank you very much, Imran, for that uh, lovely introduction. Um, uh, so we'll make a start. So, um, uh, those of you who don't know me, um, my name is Yasser Abbasi. I'm a consultant psychiatrist in adult uh, and addiction psychiatry. Um, my disclaimer is I'm here as an expert, not as a religious scholar. So this is not a talk about um, religion per se, but um, more about um, the effects of um, childhood events, the effect of trauma that we experience as children, and what impact that can have on our lives. Um, it is a a very interesting topic. It is pertinent to everyone. It's pertinent to uh, children, teenagers, uh, young adults, parents, teachers, uh, clinicians, and anyone and everyone, uh, because we are, we're all kind of uh, engaging with children. Um, and we have to be aware of what uh, impact our engagement can have. Um, 
So um, what I'm going to do uh, in this presentation is we're going to talk a bit about uh, trauma, a bit about what childhood events, adverse childhood events are. And again, for the sake of the presentation, there's no declaration of interest here. Um, again, we'll have a basic understanding of uh, what adverse childhood events are, um, what effect it can have going into adulthood, and what I call modern modern day trauma that our children do experience at the moment. Um, again, it's a mix. This talk is a bit of a mixture. That there's it's it's geared towards the non uh, medical. Uh, uh, audience, um, and I'm aware there, there are some uh, clinicians in the audience as well. There'll be a bit of a mixture. If anyone feels that I've kind of um, used a bit of a clinical term, please feel free to ask those questions um, in the Q&A section, um, and then we can clarify that in the end. Um, so um, when when you come to try and describe trauma uh, and understand trauma, there are uh, there are many ways of looking at trauma itself. And it's on a spectrum, um, and it, it 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 we all kind of experience different types of events, adverse events in our lives, which impact us. Um, but over here again, it was a very wide topic, trying to understand what to incorporate in this presentation. And eventually, we're going to focus on what we call adverse childhood events, rather than going into really severe trauma. But it all has uh, an impact, and it will all make sense whilst we complete up and finish off the presentation. But this is what a severe trauma is defined as. Um, and anyone who's had exposure to actual or threatened death, serious injury or sexual viol violation, or um, is seeing these type of events or as uh, witnessing them directly or indirectly, um, or has um, a family member or a friend who's experienced this, who's very close to them, um, can affect them in a way which will have long-term impact um, and this can happen at any age um, so we need to make sure we are able to deal with what we are exposed to and we are able to kind of come to terms with it and resolve it in a manner which makes sense to us in our own minds uh, but this is what a definition of trauma would be in a genetic sense. To experience trauma, you need to make sure there are the three E's of what um, we might call um, the effect of the trauma and the impact of it. So you have to have an event or a series of events or a set of circumstances that one is exposed to repeatedly or just a one-off, doesn't have to be repeatedly. Um, they have to have had an experience, direct or indirect, uh, which kind of affects them physically or emotionally um, and then impacts the individual's functioning uh, mentally, physically, socially, emotionally, or even their spiritual well-being. Um, so you have to have these three, three E's to see um, what uh, the impact of the whole series of events are uh, on an individual. So exposed, being exposed to event or events. Again, experiencing those events directly or indirectly, and then having an effect. And this is the crux and the core of how you try and address what trauma is. You try and address um, the subsequent impact of it, and you try and address how to resolve it. Um, so when we come to talk about adverse childhood experiences, there are multiple there. Um, and I'll kind of show you what they are um, in due course in a couple of slides later on. Um, but when they were trying to understand events and experiences, uh, they kind of came to a conclusion through a variety of number of researches that they've done that they uh, further classified into three direct and six indirect experiences that a child can experience as they're developing. Um, the more they were exposed to these types of experiences, the more um, impact it had on them as, as they were growing up. Um, and when the Department of Health released the Adverse, uh, adverse Childhood Experience um, Guidelines, the ACEs guideline, as they call it, ACE, um, they um, suggested that if you're exposed to four or more adverse experiences whilst growing up as a child, uh, then you te it tends to have more impact on your physical um, and mental and social well-being. 
So what um, are these ACEs, as we call them? Um, the direct ones, um, we can classify them as maltreatment directly to a, directed at the child. So verbal abuse, physical abuse, and sexual abuse. And each one of them are a topic on its own. You can go into exceptional detail, try and understand what verbal abuse is and what physical abuse is and what sexual abuse is. Um, but again, we're kind of touching and understanding the base. So I'm not going to go into exceptional de details, um, but we, we will touch on each of them slowly and gradually. Um, but the other six indirect ones are the more important ones for me. So uh, anyone experiencing verbal abuse or physical abuse or sexual abuse, we know very directly that they've been affected by it. It's a very serious event and we need to make sure uh, we kind of try and support the child in, in the way that we can within the social setup that we're in, uh, which includes what the state provides for us and what family support system there are. But there are other um, childhood experiences within the household sometimes, which are not really looked upon sometimes as uh, adverse experiences, or they are there, but you generally do not kind of cover them up whilst you're supporting someone. So they might not have had these direct uh, maltreatments, but uh, they've been exposed to these other six uh, indirect experiences, parental separation, domestic violence, for them to be experiencing it, for them to be witnessing it. Uh, for them to be witnessing someone within the family having mental illness, suffering from mental illness, that in itself could be a very adverse childhood experience for the child. For them to witness someone within the family, very close family member, particularly a parental caregiver or a sibling uh, having drug use um, or is a drug user, uh, it can, again, have a very... Um, adverse impact on, on the child while they're growing up, alcohol abuse, or someone within the family, uh, a close member of the family being incarcerated. And all these would have an impact uh, on the child, um, whether it's directed at them or not. So someone within the family experiencing serious mental illness or severe enduring mental health problems, uh, the complexities that come with it, um, the difficulties that people experience living within that environment uh, would impact them uh, in a way which will be quite long lasting. So the less obvious traumatic experience um, for a child within a household or within an environment um, can be further broken down. And again, uh, when I was going through this ACES training, a few of them were quite surprising to me myself. Um, even though I've, I've, I've worked in psychiatry for a long period of time, and I've kind of heard stories and, and trauma stories repeatedly from a variety of individuals. Um, but when I was going through them, I was thinking, you know what, if these things can happen um, on a regular basis, sometimes we don't even pay attention. It can happen in the best of the households. Um, but environmental factors such as um, abruptly changing schools, um, having a sick siblings, not, nothing to do with mental illness, but just having a sick sibling within the house, who's constantly unwell and the whole um, attention of the families towards that sick sibling trying to help them get better. Um, themselves going through, a, through an operation, if, if, uh, the, um, if there's constant uh, arguing and bickering within the parents, um, uh, where if they're living in, in a community which is violent and dangerous, um, or watching a parent being hurt, and that kind of encompasses not only DV, but other things as well. Uh, some serious accident that the witness, the parent going through. Um, and again, we, we don't realize these things um, as we kind of try and take it in a stride. But if not talk through properly, if not, if you don't sit down with the child, come to the level and try and understand what's going in their head, uh, they, they might interpret it in a way which, can again affect them uh, for a long time to come. Um, the other things like um, having difficult experiences in school, not just being bullied, but having uh, very difficult experiences with teachers sometimes. Sometimes you can have certain teachers being quite um, adversely addressing a child who's not that academically bright and jokingly making fun of the child which can be quite a humiliating experience for the individual. Um, and as, as they're going through that process, they can bring back a lot of baggage. And if they're not talking about it, it can kind of 
fester within them. Um, and, and again, we, when we develop and when we are faced with experiences, we develop what we call our cognitive schemas, which are in short, a thought process through which how we view the world. These cognitive schemas are developed with the experiences that we've had as we're growing up. So from childhood, you start taking things in from the age of four and five, and you start building up these cognitive schemas. Um, and the kind of experiences you have, you interpret them, and then you visualize and interpret the world in that way. And, and a lot of us look at certain things and you can, give, you can get a multiple interpretation of certain events even though um, the event is the same, but five people are seeing it very differently. And that's because of how we've been kind of, um, how, what, what, what kind of things we've been exposed to, what kind of things we've been kind of learning as we're growing up. Um, and we use all that to make sense of the world around us. Um, being constantly put down and shamed by a parental figure. Um, and again, that, that doesn't mean a, a parent cannot tell off their children. Um, I think sometimes that's necessary. Um, but it's it's how it's done. Uh, it's um, about what is being said. Uh, and it's about the consistency of it. Um, and again, parents, children, relatives, we're all human beings. Sometimes people can uh, kind of anger can take over and they can go a bit overboard. It's about realizing what has happened and then sitting down and having those discussions with the child, kind of trying to explain to them and, and expressing back their love and reaffirming their love rather than just leaving them out there with, with them kind of festering and thinking about what's, what's happened and why did my parent kind of shame me so much. Um, or not having enough attention from a, from a caregiver and being neglected or being abandoned by someone you love. Um, these, these are all very uh, um, serious kind of events in a child's life. Um, it might not be when, when you're much older, but for a child, these are very serious events um, and they, they, they feel quite um, dejected. And that feeling of dejection can again uh, give, give rise to other difficult kind of thought processes, which kind of leads up to multiple different experiences. So um, when you do experience kind of Stress, you, you develop a, a, a positive response to stress is you develop a bit of an increased heart rate, mild elevation in your stress hormone levels and you kind of control because your body's supposed to naturally react to it in that way. You, you, you're faced with the stress, you, you're inbuilt biologically to react to stress with all these chemical release, catecholamines we call them, um, uh, for you to have a fight and flight mechanism being kicked in. Um, and that's an evolutionary process. Um, but if this stress continues, then you continue to have this uh, stress response uh, and you're, you're constantly in that state. But if it resolves, then it's a bit tolerable. Um, but if it's prolonged, then it becomes uh, quite toxic and you develop what we call a dysregulated stress system. So I want, if anyone wants to know what uh, HPA access is, we can kind of discuss that later on. But um, you kind of develop a dysregulated stress system and your stress hormones are constantly released at times, even when you perceive, uh, when when things aren't that stressful, but yet you perceive them as quite stressful and, and you're constantly in that state. And sometimes we would have seen people, particularly medics who are, or, or primary care physicians who see patients coming into seeing them, they're already in that stressed uh, state and, and a little bit of a discussion kind of triggers them off and they become really angry and agitated. That's because they've always been in that state. And for them, um, that is just the norm. Um, so again, chronic traumatic stress, that dysregulated stress response can have an effect on your nervous system, on your hormonal system, on your immunological system, your immunity gets affected. So you're locked into that higher state of alertness and that higher state of alertness kind of constantly um, makes you um, uh, prone to becoming um, unwell. And we'll kind of discuss a little bit of what it can do. But you're in, in that permanent state uh, of alertness, uh, prepared for any further trauma, because that's how you see the world. You see the world giving you trauma constantly, and that is the only thing you expect. Even a discussion by someone who, who's really caring for you, you are constantly looking for clues where you think that care, a person who's giving you care is actually trying to harm you because you've been locked in that state, unfortunately. 
Um, so it is a, a kind of a dose response relationship. It simply means the more stress and the more trauma, the more ACEs someone is exposed to, the more you kind of uh, get locked in that state. Um, you you kind of get more affected, particularly if it's been it's if if the trauma is is induced or given to you by someone within your primary care giver, giver circle or your your or your loving circle, your family circle. Um, and there are other people who kind of develop it through a, a complex process of trauma experiences uh, where they experience these events over subsequent times, a little bit here, a little bit there, and then one big event happens and they start breaking down. Um, again, a psychological maltreatment can... Uh, we don't pay... We, we look at people directly uh, trying to... Um, violate someone uh, like physical abuse or sexual abuse but trauma itself can constantly impact a child's development um, and again that's why it's very important to constantly have this check-in with the uh, with a young one to see how they feel if things have not gone right um what they think about it and it, the the more most important thing is you give them space to express themselves rather than as soon as they start saying how they feel you kind of shut them down and kind of impose your view of the event, um, then you've not really listened to their view of what they've understood. Um, and only when you understand what they've understood, would you be able to fill in the gaps or be able to rectify what they've uh, misperceived. And all this kind of is re related to a number of behavioral problems. You see a lot of children with what we call oppositional defiance disorder, where there's kind of very agitated, uh, difficult in school. Um, they have a lot of emotional dysregulation. At the drop of a hat, they're ready to harm themselves. Um, the, the thinking about um, suicide um, or, or self-harm um, is because this stress, dysregulated stress response kind of makes them feel they need to do something dramatic to kind of bring that stress level down. And hence, some people end up kind of feeling a bit um, calmed down after they harm themselves only to experience that stress level go back up again. Uh, so that is the emotional dysregulation bit. Or people have um, attention deficit aspects to, to um, their concentration and things like that. So why does it matter? Um, because if you experience a co uh, throughout your life course, these ACEs, particularly when you're, when you're, when in, when you're growing up uh, as a child, uh, as I mentioned, it affects your nervous, hormonal, immunological system, affects your social, emotional well-being. It affects the way you form relationships. It affects the way you socially engage and interact with the rest of the society around you. Um, and then you start developing illnesses. Um, and these illnesses may lead to early death. Um, so <clears throat> what impacts can it have? Um, th these studies, I mean, widespread studies, but uh, the, the ACES document particularly focuses on a, uh, on, on, a, on a few studies which looked at uh, health and well-being. So if, if you are exposed to four ACEs or more, you are twice as likely to have poor diet, high BMI, and unhealthy habits. Um, you're three times more likely to smoke. You're five times more likely to have sex under the age of, you're six times more likely to have been pregnant or got someone accidentally pregnant under the age of 18. You have higher rates of other disorders like asthma, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, stroke, dementia. And again, stroke, dementia are related to a number of your unhealthy habits and poor diet, cancer, autoimmune disease. And these are not just throwing in these disorders just to make it look bulky. The, 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 the evidence that people have looked into retrospectively, they've gone back and studied individuals who've experienced these illnesses and seen how they were and what they've experienced throughout their life. And a lot of them had experienced ACEs, um, four ACEs or more. Um, and again, you can see the long-term impact that it can have. And again, we can, we can talk about these things for a long period of time, but again, for the sake of this presentation, we need to kind of touch on them and then move forward. Um, so it can also affect, again, people who've experienced four ACEs or more, it can affect how you, you engage with, within yourself and the society. So um, those individuals are twice as likely to binge drink. When you binge drink, you kind of become more uh, vulnerable to impulsive behavior and more um, risk-taking behavior and more um, uh, engaging in more dangers um, that you expose yourself to. 
Uh, the seven times more likely to experience recent violence, 11 times more likely to be in, to have been incarcerated, and 11 times more likely to have used heroin or crack. Or these are called the hardcore drugs, um, not necessarily cannabis, because cannabis kind of is an experimental drug for a lot of people. But when they go into hardcore drugs, if you look at their history back, again, you will you will see majority of them. I'm not I'm not saying all. The majority of them would have ex have had experience ex such experiences in their childhood while growing up. Um, so, is it different to gender? Um, uh, again, studies suggest that um, exposure to childhood uh, uh, trauma um, in increases risk of psychiatric symptoms in both men and women equally. So, there's no difference. What the difference is, they might be reacting different to different type of types of trauma. So. Um, women tend to be more affected by emotional and sexual abusive trauma, uh, and um, men would be affected more by emotional and physical neglect or physical trauma. Um, so the, again, this does not suggest that uh, it, it, it can't overlap, and it can overlap, but this is more commonly seen. Um, so there's no, as such, there's no gender difference. So both are equally affected, boys or girls being exposed to trauma would definitely have an impact on them as they're growing up and how they eventually uh, develop and, and how they, what kind of individuals they become. So this is just the summary of ACEs. We're going to go and talk a few more, about a few more things. Um, but as we said, there are about three direct and six indirect kind of ACEs that you can be exposed to. Um, if you are exposed to four and more, you have uh, high likely chances of becoming physically unhealthy, socially and mentally unwell. Uh, which can result in early death. Early intervention is all, always um, the preventative aspect. So if you intervene early when you've seen uh, this trauma, um, it can um, definitely change the direction of the, the, of the child's development. Um, and it's very important for people to routine, routinely inquire this and find out um, and try and address this in, in a supporting manner. Um, and again, sometimes the caregiver or the parental figure or the loved one might not be aware that the, whatever they're doing is actually a, a traumatic experience for the young one. So let me just very quickly try and play this video for you guys, if I can. Let me put it in full screen. Imran, uh, can you just quickly unmute and tell me if you can see the full screen of this? Yeah, I can see that. Okay, perfect. And if you don't hear anything, please unmute yourself and let me know. My parents don't understand. All the drinking and fighting means I'm scared. I'd like a cuddle, perhaps a bedtime story, but mostly I'd like them to stop shouting at me. And sometimes they hit me. Feeling scared every day and not feeling loved or wanted will change me for the rest of my life. Later, I'll have problems at school, problems with alcohol, and I'll get in trouble with the police. What's happening to me right now means I'm more likely to have serious health problems in middle age and die sooner than I should. Doctors say my life is full of adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. But in my world, this means I see my dad hitting my mum. Dad's got a drinking problem, and mum's always crying, even with the tablets. I'm always being shouted at and hit. After the booze and fags, there's not a lot of money for toys or clothes, or even food. I'm getting used to being scared all the time. Now I'm just angry. The doctors say things are changing inside me. My brain isn't learning how to control my feelings properly. My body can't relax like those kids who don't have aces, so my body won't be able to repair itself properly when I get older, making it more likely I'll get cancer or heart disease as an adult. It hurts when my parents hit me, but the real damage is hidden, and that damage will be with me for life.
I drink and smoke. They say I'm out of control, but I'm not. It's just my way of coping with my aces. I've been in plenty of fights, but what's wrong with that? Kids' punches don't hurt half as much as when my dad hits me. I beat up a kid last week at school because he looked at me weird. Who cares? I ended up with more time out of school. Learning's not for me anyway, and the teachers don't care any more than my parents. I don't like the way anyone looks at me except my girl. She's 16 and pregnant, just like my mum was with me. So this is where I've ended up. I've got diabetes and cancer's probably on the way. I know these kill you, but I couldn't do without them. I've never had a proper job and I've spent time inside. I hit my kids. I hit their mum too, until she left, so my kids have grown up with aces. And now my daughter had her first kid. She's 16. The course of my life was set in the wrong direction a long time ago. I know where I'm heading and sadly I know where my kids are heading too. This doesn't have to happen. A little help in childhood makes a big difference to where life takes you. When I was a baby, the nurses noticed that my mum wasn't coping and helped her and explained how important my childhood is to the rest of my life. So, with a bit of help, she coped. The police came round after next door complained about the noise from mum and dad fighting. They asked how I was feeling. I told them I was scared all the time. Mum and dad got help, the shouting got better and the hitting stopped. I even got some bedtime stories. I still had problems at school, but the teacher asked me about what was happening at home. I got help controlling my feelings. It wasn't a lot, but it was enough. I'm now married with two children, and I've got a job. Most of the time. I haven't repeated the same problems with my kids. We got help when being a parent got too much. Our children are ace-free, and that means their kids stand a good chance of growing up ace-free as well. Almost half the people in England and Wales experienced one ace as a child, and one in ten of us suffered four or more aces. If we stop aces, millions of children would not become smokers or binge drinkers, and levels of violence in adults would be cut in half. Fewer aces in childhood also means fewer adults developing diseases like cancer, heart disease and diabetes in middle age. We all need to be ace aware. Are you? Doctors, police, nurses, teachers, firefighters, and most importantly, parents. The more you know about ACEs, the more you can help stop children growing up with ACEs in their lives. And for those of you who have already suffered ACEs, the more you know, the more you can help yourself and others who have suffered ACEs cope. Right. Um, so sorry to. Um, um, it's a very somber topic, so um, it's quite heavy as well, um, and a lot of people might feel a bit uncomfortable with all this. Uh, but again, it's very important for us to be aware of all this. Um, so this child naturally had a positive ending, but not many of them do, as you as you heard, ten percent. So one in ten in England and Wales. Will experience more for 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 more aces, but also domestic violence is not only restricted to those who 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 drink. Um, it can happen in any household. Um, <clears throat> so uh, let's talk a bit more about positive things. So um, you do experience aces, and some people can experience aces, and we might all be experiencing aces here and there. So experiencing one ace does not mean that it is definitely going in this direction. As I said, four or more aces and consistently experiencing them will, uh, will end up um, having a very long-term impact on people. But what, what, what is it that helps people balance things out? Um, so again, there was a really nice research by Dr. Christina Bethel. Um, it, Johns Hopkins, and they looked at what we call positive childhood experiences. So you'd like to understand what these positive childhood experiences are. And I can, again, they would buffer against these aces or buffer against any traumatic events that a child experiences. 
Um, and anyone having at least two, but again, the same, four or more PCEs or positive childhood experiences would be in a much more healthier environment as compared to someone who just has ACEs and no PCEs or positive childhood experiences. So what are they? Uh, so the ability to talk with family about feelings, um, as I mentioned earlier, it's quite important, very essential to have someone there. The sense that family is supportive during difficult times, the enjoyment of participation in community traditions. Uh, and again, <clears throat> this, is, this is not me saying it, this has been an international research coming out, out studying of almost 6,000, well, more than 6,000 adults. So community traditions are really, really important and be engaging with them are also really, really important. Uh, feeling a sense of belonging in high school. And I guess we're in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a world where identity is constantly being questioned and you kind of are confused as to what can you identify as. It's very important for you to understand all, that we all have multiple identities. We, we, we can be British. We can then also have a, a, a particular ethnic identity. And if you want, you can then have a religious identity as well. Um, so it's important to have that belonging and multiple belonging is absolutely fine. You don't have to have a unitary belonging. So and enjoying enjoying each identity in its own right is, is absolutely essential. Um, feeling supported by friends. So having a good friend circle also helps individuals who have or might have experienced ACEs. And there might be people who never experienced ACEs and this is and that only experience positive childhood experiences. And again, it's always seen that they would um, excel and not always academically, but they will they will live a healthier life uh, with much more success in other things. So having, I, th I thought this was one of the most important thing and this kind of shows the importance of having a good social network um, and having a, a good family network around you. So uh, having at least two non-parent adults who genuinely cared, who genuinely showed affection and love and you could actually talk to them. I think that's a really, really good, uh, good thing to focus on as well. Feeling safe and protected by an adult in, in a home, uh, in, in the home that you live in. Um, so these are all the positive childhood experiences that can counter the effect of ACEs. But we all need to be aware of the ACEs and the impact that the ACEs can have. Um, so, um, Again, the, a, a brief slide um, about religion. Again, I'm not a Sheikh of Islam. I'm not a religious scholar. Neither this is a theological discussion. Uh, but just a very brief opinion there. And you, you could disagree or you could agree. Uh, that's up to you. Um, so religion can be a, a resource or a roadblock as well. Uh, for example, I mean, and again, these are published studies. Uh, studies show a more negative concept of God was related to higher severity of PTSD and depressive symptoms. And this again was a study published from the US and it was talking more about um, how um, the, uh, I think it was based on veterans and how they viewed religion. Um, uh, whereas a more positive concept of was, was related to lower severity of depressive symptoms because they can, could trust in their relationship with God um, uh, and that connection helped them and that spiritual connection. Uh, sometimes the imposition, the forceful imposition, I think we, we, we should add it there, the forceful imposition of religious rituals without much discussion around it can be confusing, not necessarily traumatic, but can be confusing, which can possibly lead to an adverse experience of the religion itself. So it's very important to talk to your children about religion if that is something which is important for you. Um, uh, but this is, again, another personal opinion here. Uh, for me, the word Bismillah rahman rahim which means in the name of Allah, the most merciful, the most gracious, is repeated the most in, in the Holy Quran, uh, almost 114 times. Uh, the, the, the meaning of Rahman is gracious, or if you look at it in the English language dictionary, it means courteous, polite, civil, pleasant and calm. And, and Rahim uh, means merciful, forgiving, compassionate, lenient, providing relief. Uh, and this is how, to me personally, uh, God is uh, very gracious, very merciful, always forgiving, no matter what you feel, where you are within your faith, um, you'll always be forgiven and there'll always be grace and there'll always be mercy. Uh, and that gives me a very positive feeling in my spiritual connection. Um, and again, as I said, I'm not a religious scholar, so I'll very quickly move out, move out of this slide now. Um, 
And I'm not going to go into the details of this, but what therapies do help um, when individuals have experienced trauma and it has had an impact. Uh, I think we don't need to medicalize every experience, but anyone experiencing this needs, uh, experiencing adverse events or being exposed to trauma needs to have that loving connection surrounding support through family and friends. And that sometimes in itself is enough. But if if they don't have that or if, they do have that, but that still doesn't resolve um, the trauma. Um, then they possibly might need more focused intervention. And psychological therapies are the best kind of evidence-based intervention that they can have. A lot of people kind of simplify psychology or psychological therapies to calling it counseling. Uh, counseling is a very, very lay term. Um, counseling is a very non-structured way of supportively talking with an individual. Um, and counseling is something that is usually very easily available within primary care settings in the world. Uh, but when you come into proper psychological therapies, then there are multiple types of psychological therapies, not only one type. And each has a different way of approaching uh, the psychological element um, and trying to resolve it. Um, so, um, again, it depends on how the, where the individual is, what kind of trauma they've experienced to decide what type of therapy would suit them better. But one thing which kind of always has been encouraged is trauma-informed care, which means you are aware that individuals like this who have, who have a heightened sense of anxiety uh, uh, needs to be approached in a trauma-informed care. Um, instead of saying, why are you doing this? Uh, you kind of say, how can we help you with this? Just, just reframing your question is having a trauma-informed approach. Um, and there's a lot of discussion about how um, generally in health facilities, we're not very well trauma-informed. Um, and there's a very, uh, if anyone kind of kicks off, it's always a very accusatory tone that comes along. Um, so just bear that in mind. Um, wherever you're interacting with people, um, or wherever you're talking with individuals uh, of what they might have gone through. And rather than an accusatory tone, kind of have a, a supporting tone. Um, so one thing we didn't discuss is what our children nowadays are going through, the impact of what I call the modern day trauma. What is modern day trauma? Um, as much as it is necessary, I don't think it's completely evil. It is absolutely necessary for our children to be exposed to this. But if it's uncontained, uncontrolled, it can be quite traumatic. Um, and that's um, technology and social media particularly. Uh, we behave very differently. And again, this in itself is a very separate topic. I presented it at, I think, the Royal College International Congress in 2019, and it was a one hour topic itself. But again, very briefly, a couple of slides on this. So you behave very differently online um, and you start acting differently online, you would never do that publicly, but whilst uh, you wouldn't do that in front of others, when you're sitting behind a screen or behind your phone or behind a smartphone, you start acting very differently, you start behaving differently, you start doing things which you might have never imagined you would do in, in a room full of people. Uh, so we do definitely behave differently uh, online compared to real life. You become more uh, you become a bit of a more risk taker. Um, so again, um, this is a screenshot of, of someone who sent it to me who had what we call screen time problems. They were picking up their phone 90 times per day, um, which kind of boils down to almost picking up the phone once every 10 minutes. Because if you take out eight hours of sleep and during the rest of the day, they're picking up their phone every 10 minutes. And this, this was... This was someone with mild to moderate problems. Can you imagine someone constantly looking at things, um, how they would be? And they're getting 657 notifications per week or 94 notifications per day on the on the screen. These, these notifications attract you towards your phone and they constantly are hitting you towards that. So this slide, I think it's a, it's a very interesting slide. This shows two seemingly really nice looking teenagers uh, who are kind of on, on social media. But they would present themselves very differently. Um, and this is the insta hit that people like to get. They, they like to get this uh, immediate um, like, which kind of makes them feel good about themselves. So they don't like to present themselves, but they like to alter the pres uh, their presentation. 
So this is how they were presenting themselves on 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 social media. And again, this I've not taken anyone's social media post. This was an article on Huffington Post, and that's why I put a different link down there. But you can see how both of them look electronically similar, but they're very um, different in the real life. Uh, but these are through filters and how they're presenting themselves, and hence developing a lot of dysmorphic, so a body. Uh, body image problems as they go along. So every everyone seeing such pictures, so they will see this and they think you can be like this. Um, whereas in reality, the different. Um, and this is how uh, our young generation is constantly being exposed to uh, this kind of unreal world. Um, and in in a real world, um, acceptance is very different. Acceptance or rejection. You give a lecture somewhere. I'm giving a lecture here. I'm giving a lecture to a group of students. Uh, you kind of get some ambiguous responses and you kind of go back and interpret it. It's it's qualitative in its nature. But with this social media, it's very quantitative. You kind of get a thumbs up or you get likes or you get followers or you have so many friends, uh, which means you're accepted, otherwise you're not. And these are very kind of uh, white measures which can create lots of psychological uh, um, unreal feeling and affect your self-esteem. And due to that, um, you see online a lot of things that were happening in the playgrounds are moving online. So there's cyberbullying, there's increase in anxiety and depression because of that. Um, there's also self-image distortion, uh, which which talks about the body and how you look at it. Uh, perceptual perceptions about being isolated because you're constantly sitting behind the screen, not socially engaging with people, um, and feeling excluded. They can a lot of people can make you feel excluded online. There's there's a whole dynamic of how people engage online. And feeling rejected online is, is is worse than being rejected on the playground. So very quickly, I think, uh, yeah, if anyone wants references for what I presented, these are some useful links as well. These are the papers that I've gone through. Um, and any questions now? Um, I'll stop sharing uh, my screen now. Over, over back to you, Imran. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Yasser. That was really infor informative. There was a lot of information there. I found it really amazing how impactful our childhood experiences can be. Uh, we've got a lot of questions from the audience. If you do have any questions, uh, use the Q&A function to pop them in and we'll try and get through as much as we can. Uh, so first we have a question asking about what the parents' role is in preventing these ACEs. What can they do? Well, I think uh, it's, um, I think it's a very good question. I think they have a very central role. Um, uh, what sometimes what what I sometimes see again, this is not a criticism on anyone or any, or, or, or or any particular society or individual or community. But sometimes I see uh, the parents who don't engage with their children as as much. Um, it, uh, socially, uh, they uh, they they they're engaging in, in adult only uh, situations. Um, the children are on their own or they're never really fully engaged with them apart from the fact that when they're kind of talking about schoolwork and things like that having these informal chats informal games sometimes just coming down to their level and engaging with them uh, spending time with them is absolutely essential the parents have a very central role the primary caregiver has a very central role there um, and i think it's um it's essential that they become aware of what aces are and what positive childhood experiences are and they are able to understand this in depth, not only in depth, they're able to kind of then support the child if they feel the child has had, had experienced any, any type of adverse um, experience, adverse um, childhood experience, not only within the household, but from the outside. And hence, sometimes as uh, children are growing up, particularly when they become going to the teens, they become more, well, they become less talkative. <laughs> they don't want to discuss much, but uh, you want to give them the personal space, but also engage with them as well. And it's a very tricky balance uh, where you want to kind of create their independence, give them the personal space, but you'd like to be in the loop uh, with 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 a view that they should trust you enough and you should trust them enough. Thank you very much. Oh, we've got another question. Um, so, is it possible for a traumatic event to be repressed to the point that all there is left are flashbacks or very slight memories of the traumatic event? Uh, it can. Uh, a lot of people do that, uh, repressed memory. Uh, they, they've gone through adverse events and they've repressed it. Um, and, and they're not consciously thinking about it, but it is subconsciously, subconsciously there. It has 
dictated how they deal with their present life because they've not really resolved their understanding of that trauma itself. So as much as some people can repress it and kind of they've gotten over it, but they've they've not really, because again, it has dictated that how they're dealing with their life as, as they go wrong. They might not be experiencing very visible mental health or physical health problems, but um, they may not be dealing with a certain life situation in the most healthiest way. So it's very important for them to sit and unravel that in a structured manner, not just anywhere with anyone, um, but in a, in a very structured manner to kind of make sure they come to terms of what they've experienced and how, how, how they deal with it. Thank you. Um, so we have another question from someone who wants clarification about the definition of trauma. So is it exposure to actual or threatened death, serious injury or sexual violation, or does psychological trauma uh, also count? Psychological trauma definitely counts. Without those advance, the simple answer is yes. The psychological trauma counts for that. Sorry, Imran, I also see another um, question here um, by someone who's talking about um, why ACEs aren't taught in school and it's not part of the national curriculum. And I think it's a very interesting question. And despite of it being important, but it's, uh, or being educated on this topic, why do you think it is not in the national curriculum? Um, I think. Um, so the question is, why Why do I think it's not in the national curriculum? Again, um, I think the, the evidence uh, was there. It's become a bit more um, mainstream. The evidence is more piling up. People are becoming aware. I think that they are increasing uh, across England and Wales. They're increasing the exposure uh, to um, within the school settings. The training teachers, um, there are a lot of teachers who are trained and really well trained in ACEs, and they're able to deal with, the, with such children in a better way. I think it, it will slowly and gradually also seep into the national curriculum. And actually, you need to have a balance of how much you kind of are putting in the national curriculum, but it is definitely important. It will get there. Um, and I think because of the current awareness of all this, it's it's getting the right attention. And hopefully, as all the teachers are being trained, they, they themselves will be the driving factor of how to bring it into the national curriculum. Um, and I think it's just a matter of time now, hopefully. Uh, so we have another question uh, asking, is childhood trauma confined to children alone or can it also affect them when they're adults? What are some strategies to help people who are affected by this trauma? So no, childhood trauma, the, the, whole, the whole point of the kind of presentation was to explain how childhood trauma can occur uh, as you're growing up. And if it's not kind of countered by positive childhood experiences or not resolved, by having a one-to-one -one discussion and debriefing with the child, it can uh, it can foster, and then you can kind of as you as you grow up, it can affect you as an adult, and it can affect you in a variety of manner. Um, so yeah, it definitely can affect you as an adult, even though you've experienced it as a child. Um, and it's it's not. I mean, again, um, I've, I've talked about domestic violence there. Um, we've, we've talked about um, uh, physical violence as well, um, uh, sometimes sexual um, abuse, which might not be a very uh, direct type of sexual abuse, but uh, within our society, kind of, uh, particularly women, girls, young girls are exposed to all sorts of kind of uh, sexual exploitation in one way or the other, and, and, and that's never talked about particularly in certain communities, is always hushed down. And I think that can, again, impact how you kind of view things and how you view the world. So it can affect you as an adult, and you need to kind of um, sit down, see what it's affecting, how it's affecting you, um, have have a discussion with trained professionals, try and see if you, you should be going for a structured um, psychological therapy, and then see if that would help. Uh, okay, thank you. I think we'll just do one more question. Uh, to what extent sure. do you think everyone has experienced an, an ACE? Do you think that everyone has? So? Um, I, I, yes, well, the, it's a very long-winded answer. So I'm not going to go and try and explain it in more detail. I think um, quite a lot of us, I would say more than 50%, would, would have had experienced ACEs in one way or the other. Um, I think the intensity of the ACEs vary. So you might have been exposed to one type of ACE, but it might not be as intense, but yet you've been exposed to it. 
And again, um, being exposed to just one age does not mean it will dramatically alter the course of your life. Um, but it's again, just being aware. Um, when you have more and more different type of faces and where they're consistent and continuous, that is when it affects you quite dramatically as an adult. But yet that does not minimize you being exposed to an area as a child, even if it's a single ace uh, and the impact it has on you. Um, and again, I, it's always suggested that you sit down with a child to discuss after whatever event has happened to understand the child's perception of what has happened. Um, for example, I, I kind of, um, you kind of see children um, who have lost relatives and, and the impact it has on them. Um, and sometimes it, they kind of think in their own mind how it kind of affects them. So it's very important to sit down and just ask them what they think rather than giving them views, just, just letting them express themselves in itself is more than enough for them to kind of have had the opportunity to be have um, listened by someone. Thank you so much for that. And thank you to the over 65 people who've joined us today. If I could just have your attention for literally half a minute, uh, I'm just going to remind everyone about the upcoming events. You don't want to miss them, trust me. Um, so we have the uh, upcoming Quran Circle. That's on the 18th of June. We have, uh, this is online. We have this masterclass, so that's already happened. Uh, these six form of fresher circles, they uh, happen very regularly. So we don't have the next ones confirmed yet, but they will be happening. Just uh, look out for those, the YM circles if you're a little bit younger, and the upcoming in-person masterclass, 25th of June, Birmingham. It's just, you, ha you have to attend, trust me, it's going to be amazing. And if you didn't remember all that information, if you can't remember all that, that's what this chat is for. Uh, all the notices will be posted there so you can keep up to date. So scan that QR code, join the chat. I think the, chat, the link to join the chat is also um in the zoom chat and yeah that's that so thank you all for coming i'll finish with surah al-asr bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim wal-asr inna al-insana lafi khusr illa ladhina amanu wa amilu al-salihati wa tawasaw bil-haqi wa tawasaw bil-sabr jazakallah khair everyone for coming especially dr yasser all the participants i hope you have a wonderful day